So why is the dodo so significant? Why does it matter so much? And why does it attract so much attention? So, our task for tonight is the Oxford dodo culture at the crossroads. And this isn't photoshopped, this is the dodo down at Land's End <laughs> earlier in the summer. <coughs> of which more anon. So, the purpose of museums really is to, to engage people with objects. That's the bottom line. Um, objects, museum objects, we call them specimens in natural history museums, have the power to tell stories, a great power to tell stories and to engage people with those stories. And really exceptional objects have the power to tell an exceptional range of stories. And for those who aren't familiar with the works of Stephen Polyakov, um, he's a, a theatre writer and a, a film writer. And some years ago, he produced a TV series called Shoot in the Past, which is, for me, one of the most profound insights into museum studies that's available. It's piecing together a photographic archive uh, to tell a story. If you haven't seen it, download it now, and I don't get any royalties. I would say that that's exactly what we do in museums. Um, and we seek to use those objects to tell a whole variety of stories. And tonight we're going to concentrate on the dodo, and particularly, of course, the dodo that's particular to this city, the one specimen uh, that, that uh, will inform all of our discussions, the Oxford dodo, as we'll call <coughs> it. And the dodo was taken um, from Land's End to John O'Groats earlier this summer. That's, uh, we saw the Land's End leg. This is the John O'Groats leg, um, just before it went wild in the highlands of Scotland. And uh, along the way, we attracted very large numbers of, of people who travelled anything up to three hours to see that one dodo specimen and the reconstruction that you can see in front of you. So why did people drive three hours to see that one specimen? And I think we'll flesh that out as the evening proceeds. With regards to Oxford, the, the dodo pervades the city. It's everywhere once you start looking. Um, this gargoyle is sitting on the corner of the Bodleian, staring down on the Sheldonian Theatre. This dodo is in Christchurch Hall, in the Lewis Carroll window. And so it's begun to infiltrate everything. If you really want to start hunting, there's a, a dodo chair somewhere amongst the several hundred in Christchurch Hall as well. And this is the one specimen that we're talking about. It, it's the specimen that's in front of you, and you'll have a chance to see it later on in the proceedings. And you know, it's far from being our most spectacular natural history specimen, if I'm honest. It's a rotted bird. We've only got the head and the foot left. But nonetheless, it's informed so many aspects of our culture. So let's look at some of the stories that the dodo tells, and I'll leave it to my colleagues on the panel to look at some of the other stories. <coughs> but first of all, how did it come to Oxford? So the Oxford dodo started off life um, in London. It may or may not be a specimen that was recorded in London in 1638 where people could pay a penny to feed the dodo, um, recorded by a man called Hamel Lestrange. And a little later, a specimen is recorded in a collection of a father and son team who really founded the first museum. This is the Museum Traviscanti Arnhem uh, in what's now Vauxhall in South London. And it appears that a specimen appears in their collection catalogue in 1656. This may or may not be the same specimen, or there may have been two dodos that came uh, to, to London as live specimens. It's transferred to the Ashmolean Museum in 1659 in somewhat controversial circumstances. Uh, the Travis could sell the collection to Elias Ashmol, who founds the collection. Um, Tr John Travis the younger's wife, disputes the will. Um, and takes Elias Ashmore to court. She loses. She's then found face down, drowned in the garden pond next door to Elias Ashmore's house. So it's all very controversial from the start. 
and then it becomes a specimen that we study scientifically later on. This is the site of the Tra Museum Tradescontianum now, and it's somehow appropriate <laughs> that it's a fried chicken bar. <laughs> It comes to, to Oxford and it features in, in the, the old Ashmolean Museum, what's now the Museum of the History of Science. And although we don't, can't see the specimen, we can see the painting that's downstairs uh, by Savary um, at the end of, of the old Ashmolean, which was given the splendid name, the Nick Nacker Tree, which I remind the director of the Ashmolean frequently. <laughs> so where did dodos come from? So they were found on this island here, Mauritius. And they were found probably initially by Portuguese sailors who were beginning to explore the, the Indian Ocean, um, but they were first described fully by Dutch sailors who were doing the same. Um, and the other island that we'll refer to a little later on is this island, Rodriguez, uh, which is a few hundred kilometres to the east. So the Dutch first described the dodo in 1598. Uh, this is their arrival. Um, um, Mauritius, it was clearly a land of plenty. It was important that it was a land of plenty because they wanted to stock up their ships um, as they explored the Indian Ocean. And Mauritius was the first landfall after they turned the southern Cape of Africa. You can see the very first illustration of a dodo lurking in the trees there. They bigged it up a little bit, as uh, explorers are prone to do. But nonetheless, it's a reasonably accurate, if vicious beaked looking organism. The sad thing is that that's the first description in 1598. It was extinct by 1662, 64 years from first discovery to extinction. And we'll come back to that here, where this is an early uh, painting recently found, uh, the last illustration of a, of a living dodo. Um, and so this is the first really clear-cut example uh, of, of where humans have found a new species and driven it to extinction within a few decades. And therefore, it, it's become something of a, a poster child, along with giant pandas, uh, for human-induced extinction. So the first of our stories that it tells, and the most obvious story that it tells, is with, with regards to um, humans driving species to extinction. The reason it was driven to extinction was because, precisely because, the Dutch were using Mauritius to stock up as they explored the Indian Ocean. So, first of all, they tried eating dodos. That wasn't entirely satisfactory from anyone's perspective. Um, and you'll notice from my first slide, and I'll go all the way back, there are two words for, for dodo in Dutch. Uh, one is, is valvo, which translates as approximately insipid bird. It didn't matter how long you cooked it, how you cooked it, it still tasted pretty nasty and greasy. Um, but dodo itself comes from dodars, which is the old Dutch for, for fat arse or fat bum, um, which you can see it does possess um, and is also an indication that it might not have been the best eating possible. So. Humans did cause extinction, but they didn't cause it by eating dodos to death. They were easy to catch. If you pick one up by the feet, it would squawk, and all the other dodos would come uh, to, to uh, find out who was squawking, at which point you could knock them on the head and take them back to the boat. But actually, what did for dodos was the introduction of pigs, which the Dutch introduced to provision their ships um, as they sailed across the Indian Ocean. So the, the pigs ate the same food on the ground as the dodos, um, but they also ate dodo eggs. So, not a, a good tale. That map is one of the first illustrations of the Indian Ocean. And, of course, the story proceeds to exploring the whole Indian Ocean uh, out to a rudimentary Australia and Southeast Asia. And, and so, in a, an indirect way, the dodo tells stories and is directly involved in Western European exploration of the Orient of, of Eastern Asia, um, and the general exploration and mapping of the, of the globe. So another important story for the dodo. This is a, a deliberately complicated bit of science, just to remind us that it tells really important scientific stories. It's six o'clock, apparently. Um, the specimen that we have here in Oxford is the only one 
preserves soft tissues. It's the only one that we can do DNA analysis on. And because of that, it's been sampled uh, about 12 years ago, uh, 15 years ago, the paper came out in 2002, um, and it resolves dodos as sitting in this group here. Now, you won't be able to read all the names, but basically, all of these names surrounding the dodo are pigeons. So the dodo, despite its rather weird appearance, is basically a very large, flightless pigeon. And it's, this is one of the least surprising pieces of genetic research that's been done um, in, the, in the past 30 years, because Actually, the first anatomist who described the dodo in 1824 predicted off the, the anatomy of the skeleton uh, that it was exactly that, a dodo. Sorry, a pigeon. They also predicted it was a dodo. Uh, this is an alternative way of, of looking at it, and you'll see that actually it sits amongst this group, the crowned pigeons. We have a crowned pigeon in all its glory sitting there. Um, and the next closest relative is, is a thing called the tooth-built pigeon. The dodo um, and its near relatives would sit just here. We're not quite sure of the, the structure of this uh, in terms of the final uh, resolved relationships uh, of, of dodos, but they are definitely uh, pigeons and they're definitely closely related to the crowned pigeons. The nearest relative is also extinct. It lived on that adjacent island of Rodriguez, a few hundred kilometres to the east, also found in the early 1600s by the Dutch, extinct by the early 1700s. It lasted a few decades longer. Extinct for the very self-same reasons, introduction of pigs and um, destruction of habitat. And that's a lesson for all conservation biology studies because that's the most common means of inducing extinction. It's not that we directly kill things, it's that we destroy habitat. So this is the nearest living relative of the dodo. Uh, we have a, a few uh, preserved specimens that we'll take down to the museum for you to look at, but the photograph gives you a much better idea of the animal. The Nicobar pigeon is common all the way down the Indian Ocean um, and is a perfectly typical flighted pigeon. The next closest relative uh, are these things, the crowned pigeons. This is uh, one species, that's the, another species, there are three in total. This is the Victoria crowned pigeon, a spectacular and large bird. Um, and another lesson in terms of biological conservation is that the little dodo, the next closest relative, is actually again on the list of most endangered birds globally. It's the 34th most endangered bird in the world. We're not learning our lessons. That group is particularly prone to human interference and extinction. Um, and it may or may not survive. But the power of the dodo is the fact that, as we will hear in a moment, it crosses over into other spheres of human activity. It crosses over into the into Dutch landscape and uh, still life art in the early 1600s, uh, particularly a, uh, an uncle and nephew team called uh, the Savarys, Roland and Jan Savary. Um, and here is a dodo uh, drinking... <coughs> from a river with an assemblage of birds that the Dutch had discovered as they explored the globe. It tells that global exploration story as well. So we have Amazonian parrots. We have the first uh, known illustration of a cassowary from Papua New Guinea. Um, so it, it, it's telling the story about all the things that the Dutch have discovered as well as illustrating the dodo. There's a suspicion that all of these rather fat dodos are not as they were. Um, they were probably all kept in captivity. They were probably all rather overfed because there was a temptation to feed a penny to pay, uh, feed, uh, pay a penny to feed the dodo. Um, and these were probably rather obese individuals, as is the one illustrated downstairs in, in our museum. This is again by uh, Roland Savary. And his less artistically accomplished nephew, uh, <laughs> Jan Savary. Unfortunately, we have a copy of the former painting and the original of this one. I'd rather it was the other way around. Um, there are some better, probably more anatomically correct reconstructions. This is a, a, a previously unpublished Dutch uh, painting that was auctioned at Christie's in 2009 and shows a much more anatomically lifelike bird. But probably the best of the bunch is this one uh, from the Mughal emperors. Some, the, some dodos made their way into the... Uh, the Indian Empire, the Mughal Empire, uh, where they were kept um, 
as, as garden pets. And here they reconstruct a, a much more slim line, of slightly aggressive looking bird. And dark, they almost certainly wear two different colorways, this, this gray form and this dark form. May have been boys and girls, we're not 100% sure. And then, again as we'll hear in a moment, but I'll just briefly introduce it, the dodo crosses over into literature. And, and it crosses over to literature in this building because it was in this building that Charles Dodgson, a mathematician, uh, brought a little girl called Alice to look at the museum objects. And that encapsulates the dodo within Alice's adventures in Wonderland. Directly from looking at museum stories and telling stories, uh, museum objects and telling stories about museum objects. And once it gets into to Lewis Carroll, uh, Charles Dodgson's writing name, then it really does begin to go everywhere globally uh, as a cultural phenomenon. So the illustration by John Tenniel uh, in the 1860s begins to uh, iconise the, the dodo. It's picked up in 1896 by uh, Hilaire Belloc in his Bad Charles Book of Beasts. Not the best poem. The dodo used to walk around and take the sun and air. The sun yet warms his native ground. The dodo is not there. <laughs> the voice which used to squawk and squeak is now forever dumb. Yet you may see his bones and beak all in the museum. <laughs> 18, the 1950s, it makes it into Disney, and it really is becoming a global phenomenon by that point. And then the final step in the elevation of the dodo to, to a global cultural icon is that, of course, it then makes an appearance as a star uh, in a film by the makers of, of Wallace and Gromit. And you really know that your museum object has made it when it appears in a film by the makers of Wallace and Gromit. So this museum, as our Twitter handle says, is more than a dodo, uh, but the dodo is very important, and I'll let other members of the panel just flesh that out for us. Do you want some